All right. So here we are, finally, at long last, in Luke chapter 24. And no, we're not going to finish it today. Sorry. One of the big reasons why Christians should really be making a much bigger deal about the holiday we call, or most call Easter, but really we should be calling it Resurrection Day, is that this resurrection, this event, is the central point of the Christian faith. Everyone is born. Christmas is just another birthday, okay? Everyone dies. So Good Friday is just another death. Okay. However, it is the resurrection that brings both of those holidays, rise them above the commonplace, because it is, it is the resurrection that makes true Christianity unique among the world's religions. Now, all other world's religions exhort man to reach up to reach God and to try to get to him by their own efforts. But Christianity is the only re- religion where God is reaching down to us. Okay? Other religions are systems of do's and don'ts. And there are some versions of Christianity that kind of feel the same way. They're very legalistic. You have to do this and not do that in order to appease God. But true Christianity is a relationship with the creator of the universe. It's a relationship with God. And Christianity looks to the Bible as the singular source of truth. But all of these factors would be worthless without the resurrection. Okay, Paul made this very clear when he was writing his first letters to the first of his letters to the Corinthians. And he told them in chapter 15, and let me read, you don't have to turn that, let me read it to you. Starting in verse 12, now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But it is, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did, he did not raise up. In fact, the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if this, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. Now, Paul was addressing believers that had been somehow infected with the prevailing Greek philosophy of the time that essentially mocked the whole concept of of, uh, resurrection. If you were a typical pagan Greek or Roman man of the world, the dead ended up in an underworld somewhere, the realm of Hades or Pluto, depending on which language you spoke. And now, this may kind of seem odd to us, okay? Because as we know, we know as Christians about the resurrection of Christ, but the world around us, Well, they freely talk about life after death. You hear about out-of-body experiences, especially during surgeries or illnesses where suddenly they're hovering over the the operating table and they see the doctors working on them, trying to bring them back. Or they have seances to talk to the dead to get advice about what they should do. And this is just a couple of them. Astral projection, all this kind of weird stuff. To us... Talking about someone rising from the dead is not that difficult to think about, okay? But the ancient Greeks, this was complete foolishness. That's why they had such an issue when Paul was preaching in Athens, talking about this very topic. Now, we're going to get to this point deeper in when we hit Acts 17. But in essence, we are all familiar, or we should be familiar with the story of Paul at the Arachabas, excuse me, Areopagus, or Mars Hill, and he was waiting for his companions on his mission. He's walking around looking at all these idols all throughout Athens, this, this religious capital of ancient Greece. And he was grieved by it. He really didn't like what he saw. And so 
while he was was preaching at the synagogue about Jesus, about uh, the resurrection, and there were some philosophers that happened to hear him talk, and they're thinking, you know, we want to know more about this. So they grab him and they take him, uh, let's go up here to the Oropagus so you can tell us about this. And in fact, it's interesting how they referred to him uh, in Acts 17. What does this babbler want to say? And some were saying, oh, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods. And they, and they take him up there and says, okay, now, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? And they were very, being very philosophical. They were, some of the Stoics were there and the Epicureans. And, and as I really kind of like how Luke put it in verse 21, for all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. This is how they pass the time away, just debating what is truth or other vague things. And so Paul stands there, and we're not going to go through the entire sermon, but essentially Paul does what any good preacher on the mission field is going to do. He knows his audience, and so he basically connects with them. He starts out with, Men of Athens, I notice that in all things you are very religious. And as I was passing through and looking at these objects of worship, I noticed that you an altar with an inscription that said, to an unknown God. So he's connecting with the people right now. He's acknowledging. He's not sitting there saying, you heathen, you're going to burn in hell and so forth. No, he's just basically trying to reach them. He's not trying to offend them yet. And now he's going to say, hey, let me tell you about this unknown God that you've been worshiping all this time. And he goes and he basically gives a brief message of the gospel. And in fact, he actually mentions excerpts from the popular Greek poets at that time. Uh, if someone doesn't know the Bible, it's kind of worthless to sit there and quote the Old Testament. And he knew that. So he would, he would say, as your poets would say, he would do this a couple of times. And when he got to the end, he's talking about the resurrection. And the response was decidedly negative. Some mocked while others said, well, we will hear you again on this matter. Sounds like when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking at the door. Okay. You get them into a tight corner. Well, we got to go. So uh, we'll be back. We'll be back. And I've learned by now. No, you won't. At least I'll say that for the LDS missionaries. They will be back. Okay, they're true to their word. Oh, Jehovah's Witnesses? No, nah, they don't want you. You go, I'm in a corner. They don't want to listen to you anymore. So why was this concept of resurrection such a source of mockery? Why did the Greeks think this? Well, the concept of a dead body rising from the dead was really unheard of in Greek culture and the differing, for, for, yeah, differing philosophies at this point mocked it for different reasons. Now, there are two schools of thought that is mentioned here in Acts. Um, you have the Stoics, and we could do a sermon on, on the Stoics in and of themselves. But in essence, they thought that the whole concept of resurrection went against the natural order of nature. I mean, there's a lot more than believed, but that was essentially the bottom line. And the Epicureans were focused on experiencing the here and now as opposed to worrying about what was going to happen to you after death. So Paul was dealing with these two philosophies when he was writing to the Corinthians. He was saying, you know, these are narrow-minded beliefs. Why? Because there are so many witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus. And all of these people can't be liars. Some of them died for their faith. People do not die for a lie. Simple as that. The main evidence resided in Paul himself because the resurrection changed his life as it changed the life of all the disciples. After Jesus was crucified, all the disciples ran and hid. But as we are going to see, when they saw the risen Lord, they knew that Jesus was all that he said he was and he proved that he was indeed God in the flesh. And no other religious leader, no other religious leader has died in full view of trained executioners, had a guarded tomb, then rose three days later to appear to so many people. 
No other religion can claim that. Oh, there are some that said, oh yeah, he, he rose from the dead, but there's no proof of it. They just said he did, but they didn't find any proof of it. Okay, And frankly, they accuse Christians of the same, same thing. But the evidence is there, if you're willing to look at it. Buddha didn't rise from the dead. Muhammad, no, he didn't rise from the dead. Confucius didn't rise from the dead. Neither did Krishna. None of these avatars they talk about, only Jesus is physically risen from the dead, physically walked on water, claimed to be God, and only Jesus raised others from the dead. Okay? Only in Christianity do we have the person of Christ who claimed to be God, performed all these miracles to prove that claim of divinity. He died, he rose from the dead, and claimed that he alone was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but by him, period. Now, this is an interesting point. It is no surprise that Satan has attacked the truth of the resurrection from the very beginning. Okay, we see it today. It, the first lie he spawned was that the disciples came and stole the body. Okay, it's difficult to imagine, though, how they could have done this. Now, to begin with, the tomb was carefully guarded, which I find ironic because the Jewish religious leaders who were Jesus' enemies, they remember him talking about being resurrected. And so they, they basically said, yeah, we want to guard on this tomb. This guy said he was going to raise from the dead, so let's put a guard and make sure that doesn't happen because their thoughts were, oh, yeah, well, his disciples will probably come in the middle of the night and steal the body. So they sealed the tomb. They put a guard out front. However, here's the interesting point that people don't realize. Given this, do you honestly think that these frightened apostles are going to overpower professional soldiers, open that tomb, and secure the body? Ain't going to happen. They were hiding. They were afraid for their lives. They were afraid they were going to be next. No, nah, they didn't think about stealing a body. But really, to be honest, this tells you one interesting point about those apostles. The reason they weren't interested in stealing a body because they themselves did not believe that Jesus was going to be resurrected. They figured, this is it. It's done. Why keep going on like this? Some of the other gospels talk about what their next point was. Peter basically says, hey, let's go fishing. Kind of comes out of nowhere in John, but to be honest, it's, it's like, okay, we've done all we could. We've wasted the last three years of our lives life. I can fish. I know the rest of you can. Let's go. Let's get back in the job. Off they go. Then there was a second lie. And we kind of mentioned this a little last week. The second lie was that Jesus didn't really die on the cross, but he swooned. He fainted. The pain was intense. We know that. But basically, once they took him down, once they put him in the nice, cool tomb, it revived him. And somehow, someway, this revived person who had just gotten beaten to a pulp managed to roll the stone away by himself and go for a walk past these soldiers. Don't think so. Remember, last week, and this is what dispels this idea, Pilate had the soldiers check. Is Jesus actually dead? I'm sure they had at times people who seemed like they were dead and weren't. And then they took him down, they threw him in a garbage dump, and then they woke up, oh, what just happened? I'm sure it did happen. Wouldn't surprise me. So to make sure of it, they stabbed him in them with a spear. Water and blood comes out. Pierced through the heart, I don't think he's, he's alive. Sorry, he didn't swoon. And to be honest, how could this whole thing, if he did roll away this stone, how could he appear through closed and locked doors? Or disappear in front of the sight of people. We're going to talk about that today. Now it just really goes down to Satan has been trying to discredit the message of the gospel because it rests on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And if he can put doubt on the resurrection, that goes a long way to trying to discredit the whole gospel truth. And as we know, Jesus or, uh, Satan tries desperately. See, the apostles were sent out as witnesses to his resurrection. And as we're going to see when we start the book of Acts, 
That emphasis is on the resurrection of Jesus. All through it. You will see that theme go from beginning to end. So now, go ahead and turn back to, if you have your Bible with you, turn to Luke 24. After that rather long introduction. Okay. It's been over a year. And we're almost to the end. But not quite. This chapter 24 and its corresponding chapters in the other Gospels, these are the penultimate chapters of each Gospel because it describes this event we've been talking about, the resurrection. Much as when we discovered the true meaning of the Gospel message of salvation and our lives was changed, so it was when G- with Christ's disciple and his followers. Once they found out that Jesus was alive, it made a tremendous difference in their lives. So let's begin Luke 24, starting in verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then when they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus... And it happened, as they were greatly perplexed about this, that, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid, they bowed their faces to the earth. They, said to, they, they, the men, said to them, the women, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, And on the third day, rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. But Peter arose and ran to the tomb And stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. Very short and sweet. Probably one of the briefest descriptions of the whole resurrection experience among the Gospels. We do not know at what time Jesus rode from the dead on the first day of the week, but it must have been very early, perhaps before daybreak. Luke doesn't tell us. Now remember, we kind of went through this last week. The task of preparing the body for permanent burial had not been completed when Jesus was first placed in the tomb. It was in the afternoon, and it was too close to the beginning of the Sabbath. After all, you know, they didn't want to appear like they were working on the Sabbath, even though the law gave special dispensation for this type of work. After all, people died on the Sabbath too, and it was Jewish tradition to bury them the same day they died. So that had to be some dispensation in the law. But these guys decided, no, we are not going to do this. We're going to do a a very quick and dirty, quote unquote, quick and dirty job to make sure he's good, he's buried, we've got the process started. We come back on the first day after the Sabbath, we'll finish the job and make it correct. Now notice what they're doing. They want to, they're they're not convinced he's rising from the dead. They're preparing for a permanent burial. So, Mary Magdalene, okay, she's mentioned. She had been especially helped by Jesus after being uh, freed from uh, a large number of demons, okay? She was very devoted to him, so much so that some believe that she was actually his wife. Several blasphemous stories that come out from various sources that say this. We see in Mark that Mary had lingered at the cross, and it seemed only fitting that she was the first at the tomb that morning, and with her was Mary, the mother of James, Joanna, and other devout women. Okay? They were anxious to get this job done, but they weren't thinking about rising. No, he's not there. Luke doesn't mention it. We've talked about already about the guard. And it's not clear if the women knew the guard was there. But what they were a little, should have been worried about and thinking about was, okay, how are we going to get into the tomb? Okay? There's a big old stone, much taller than me, and it's round. 
and probably weighed the size of a good-sized car, and trying to move one of these things aside, well, you could do it. There was ways to do it if you had the right equipment, just a lever to push it along and people to help out. But this would have been hard for these women. They weren't strong, after all. And even if they did know about the guard, they're pretty certain that these Roman soldiers probably weren't going to help them. Because there was a seal. Pilate actually put an official seal on the stone. And if the seal was broken in any way, it would have been tampered. Now, when we say a seal, we're not talking about someone took concrete or something and completely boxed it in so it was never going to move again. It was actually just a wax on some type of paper or a piece of wax that covered one side of it, had the signet ring, the signet of a pilot on it. And if anybody tampered with it, that seal would break and you were liable for death if this happened. Um, a few years ago at a church, our former church had rented, um, there was a gentleman by the name of Stuart who was, a, we called him the church mouse. He actually lived at the church. And one day the poor guy passed away. He was old and in bad health. And it was three days before anyone discovered it. It's kind of a sad story. But the point of what I'm saying here is the coroner's office, after they, they took him away, they sealed that room that he was in because it was a criminal investigation. The guy died unexpectedly. They needed to find out what was going on. And the seal was just a piece of paper with a little holographic seal of the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office. But that's the kind of thing we're talking about. Nothing big, just this little thing sitting there, and you don't break that seal under penalty of the law. Big time. So they're wor- they may have been worried. They're going up there, how are we going to get in? How are we going to get to this tomb? How are we going to finish the job? And, but they were determined to do it, but a kind of a cool thing happened. Why are you worrying about it? God had already solved the problem. The other gospels tell us there was an earthquake and the stone rolled away. And the guards who were there took off. So by the time they got there, they find this open tomb. And there's another problem that got solved. When they looked inside, there was no body. So they had all these spices and stuff for nothing. At this point, there are two angels that appear on the scene. Okay, the, Luke describes them as men, but he describes their, their clothing as, as shining brightly. And Matthew and Mark say there's only one who gave the message, but Luke mentioned two. Why? It goes back to Jewish law. The verification of event can only be verified by the, the statement of two witnesses minimum. So there are two angels to tell them what had happened. And this is kind of consistent with what Luke had done earlier. Remember, a lot of people were witnesses for Christ. You think of at the very beginning when Jesus was just a baby. He's taken into the temple. And there are two witnesses there to witness what's going to become of him, Simeon and Anna. We talked about that in Luke chapter 3. Okay. And as the angels address them, he's not here. But then they kind of go into teacher mode, I call it. A little rebuke here. They reminded him, they reminded them, remember how he told you. Remember what he said. More than once, Jesus had told his followers that he was going to suffer and die and be raised from the dead. And like I said before, it's kind of ironic the Jewish leaders remembered that and tried to stop it. But the, the, his followers, who were hanging on every word he said, ignored it. So the women, they're just kind of freaked out at this point. There's these angels. They were fearful. This is pretty typical. If an angel kind of appeared to you, you'd probably be kind of freaked out as well. Okay. Off they go. They're rushing back to the disciples to inform them of what they had seen. And the men didn't believe them. The men didn't believe them. And before we're really too hard on the disciples, let's remember the culture of that time the witness of women was not acceptable in those days okay I read somewhere during when we were studying this that it took the witness of two women to equal the witness of one man okay 
the apostles in their unbelief were unable to comprehend the reality of what the women were saying. And a lot of it was, well, you're women, so therefore, you know, it's just, you know, yeah, we just can't rely on you, okay? Stereotype, typical, but it was typical of that time. And they weren't expecting the event. That's the thing. They weren't believing it. If they were waiting, okay, let's find out if Jesus, oh, he did, great, let's go and see him. They weren't expecting it. So when these women coming in, they're thinking, you're seeing things. This can't be true. This is impossible. And so, but the women were not hallucinating. They had seen the truth. And Mary Magdalene asked Peter and John to go, I will go see for yourself. This is out of the Gospel of John. Go and see for yourself. They went there. John makes a very interesting point that he got there first. Then Peter went in first. Okay. And they saw the proof that Jesus wasn't there. But all the evidence, with all that evidence that the body was gone and there'd been no violence, the tomb didn't blow up or anything, that just he was gone, there was something else. You know, there was something else. They were still trying to wrap their brains around it. They didn't know what happened here. Maybe they thought, well, maybe the Jewish authorities didn't like what Joseph of Arimathea did, so they came and they wrapped, they took the body away. We don't know what they were. What we do know is they found, they had a hard time believing this. Faith is a hard thing to get, especially when you're in a low place. And these disciples, we cannot deny, they were in probably one of the lowest places ever. But that didn't matter. We know, we didn't have to see, we know Christ is alive with us. Our faith helps us. The Holy Spirit helps us. They didn't expect to see him alive. They had forgotten his promises. They went to the tomb just to do something. To say that they saw hallucinations and that they thought they saw Jesus. No, people who are hallucinating, they think they see someone alive. They're expecting to see them alive. They weren't expecting anything. And too many people, they, you know, someone were saying, oh, yeah, modern people, yeah, they're hallucinating. No, no, there's too many people hallucinating the same thing. That doesn't happen. Because once they did see Jesus, they became excited. They changed. Remember what he said earlier? The fact of the resurrection changed lives. But there's more. Let's look at verse 13. Now, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then one, of the, one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have not known the things which have happened these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, Today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. And he, Jesus, said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all the prophets of, in all that the prophets had spoken, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. 
And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is indeed is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, Emmaus was a small village about eight miles northwest of Jerusalem. And the men who were walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, they were, very, they were just discouraged disciples. They weren't any of the eleven, which meant they really had no reason to be too terribly discouraged. But they had heard the reports of his resurrection, and like the rest, they didn't believe him. Now, why were these guys so sad about it? Well, they were... They hoped that Jesus was going to lead them into redemption against Rome. Free Israel from their oppressors. And they were hoping he was going to do it right away. But then their hopes were shattered because suddenly he's dying and buried. And we get the impression that these men were discouraged and disappointed because God did not do what they wanted him to do in their timetable. They saw the glory of the kingdom. But they failed to understand why the suffering was necessary. So as they're walking, they're talking about this. They're just kind of hashing it out. And a lot of people, that's how they process. When something weird has happened, they're just talking to one another, trying to make sense, which way is up, which way is down, what are we trying to do? And at some point, Jesus appears on the scene and joins them in their journey. Though he's incognito, they cannot, they do not recognize him. This is a miracle. Okay? And he's just walking along. And this is a common enough occurrence in this era because as you're walking along the road, there's safety in numbers. Despite Roman patrols, there were still robbers out there. And the more you had, the safer you were. So they're just walking and Jesus is listening in on the conversation. And perhaps they were quoting Old Testament scripture and different prophecies. And they were trying to recall, hey, did Jesus say this? Well, let me think. Did he? And they just back and forth. But they're unable to can make sense out of it and come up with an explanation of why things happened as they happened. Was Jesus a failure? Was he a success? Why did he have to die? And most of all, was there a future? Was there a future? And there seems to be a touch of humor when Jesus finally comes up and asks, "Uh, what are you guys talking about? And and I'm sure he was kind of being ironic in a way because, after all, he had been at the heart of all that had happened in Jerusalem. So now he's asking him, "Uh, tell me what happened. I want to hear it from your point of view. And it kind of shows us how patient our Lord is with us as he listens to us tell him what he already knows. Very common thing. This is just another example, and this is a side note, just an example of how we can come boldly into his throne and pour out our hearts to him and not feel bad about it and knowing that he's going to help us. And yeah, he knows what's going on, but we're still telling him anyway. Well, anyway. He asked the question, and Cleopas talked, and he kept basically was telling them, yeah, this is what happened. You know, we, you know this, we had such high hopes in this Jesus, and they killed him, and we don't know what, what's going on. He's indicting himself with his mouth for their unbelief, and what more evidence could they want? There were witnesses, the apostles especially, had seen the tomb empty. Angels had announced that Jesus was alive. The proof was there. So Jesus then gives a foreshadowing of Romans 10, 17. We're all familiar with that verse. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So what does he do? He opens the word to him. Let me tell you a few things. As they're walking, he's pointing out the problem is not in your heads, guys. It's in your heart. You could have discussed this subject for days and never are going to come up with an answer because you're not looking to the word. You're not seeing what the prophets are actually saying. You need a fresh understanding of what the word of God means. And Jesus went a long way to do this. He opened the scriptures and opened her eyes. 
And then they realized that Jesus was not only alive, but with a shock, they realized he was there with them the whole time. They didn't believe all that the prophets had written about the Messiah. But let's face it, that was a common problem among the Jews of that day. They saw the Messiah as a conquering redeemer, but they did not see him as a suffering servant. They ignored the prophecies in Psalms 22 and in Isaiah 53, among others. And they plainly said so. And they read the Old Testament. They saw the glory, but they ignored the suffering. They focused on the crown, but didn't really look at the cross. The teachers, they were taught this. This is a sad part. This was an identity of the symptoms were systemic. It was part of the system was rotten, as Jesus had pointed out. I like to look at it this way. The teachers in that day were pretty similar to some of the pastor feel-good preachers of today. Preaching about God's love, that's great, but they ignore the fact that God is also just and righteous. And they thus leave out the need of salvation for Christ. Big mistake. They can't do that, as the Pharisees had figured out. I would have been loved to have been a fly on the wall as these guys were walking. You know, just listening to this really what was a Bible conference between these three guys. The greatest teacher explaining the greatest themes from the greatest book and bringing the greatest blessing to their eyes. Eyes opening to see him, hearts opening to receive the word, and lips opening to tell others what Jesus was saying to them. Who knows where he started, but just in my own mind, I'd like to think that Jesus started at Genesis 3 talking about the first promise of a redeemer. And he started tracing that promises through the scripture. Probably lingered a little bit at Genesis 22 when he tells of Abraham placing his only beloved son on the altar. Definitely probably talked about the Passover. We have gone over the significance of the parallels between the Passover and the crucifixion. Probably went over the the meanings of the different sacrifices, the different temple and tabernacle ceremonies. The serpent in the wilderness, the day of atonement. He probably talked about, hey, let's look at Isaiah 53, even though they didn't call it back back then. The whole thing about the suffering servant and the prophetic messages in the Psalms, Psalm 22, Psalm 69. The key to understanding the Bible is to see Christ on every page, Old as well as New Testament. He didn't just teach them doctrine or on prophecy. He taught them the things concerning himself. These men had talked to Jesus. They listened to Jesus until they reached their destination in Emmaus. And they wanted more. And Jesus, you know, sometimes people do this. He's going to make it, make it out like he's going to continue along. Well, probably say, well, guys, it's been nice talking with you. I got to keep going. And they're saying, oh, no, no, no. Stay here. Stay here. We want to hear more. And to be honest, they also threw in typical Eastern hospitality. Look, it's getting close to night. You need a place to stay. Come on, you can stay with us. We got, you know, we'll feed you. We'll give you a place to sleep. They didn't even know who the stranger was, but all they know, he, they didn't want him to go. Their hearts were burning within him, within them, excuse me. And they wanted that blessing to continue on. And this shows that the more we we receive the word of God, the more we will wait or we will want to fellowship with the God of the word, provided we have the proper motivation. There is a difference between studying the Bible for knowledge and studying it for inspiration. With the Pharisees, we saw that understanding the Bible, knowledge for its own sake can just lead to an inflated head. Oh, yeah, it's nice to be able to know all these different prophecies, but are you able to apply it? Are you able to do it? No, 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 no. When you're studying the Bible, the whole point is not just gathering stuff up here, but applying it down here. Receiving Bible truth and walking with the Savior. Savior. This is what leads to the burning of the bosom, guys. The burning of the heart. Not an emotional experience over something you've read or something you've seen, but the spirit working inside saying, this is it. 
Now, when they're talking about breaking bread, this is just the, after, the evening meal. Okay, they're not talking about the Lord's Supper. Some people say, well, that's how they identify them is, is Jesus did the Lord's Supper right there. No, 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 because remember, these were not part of the 12 who witnessed the Lord's Supper. Okay, and I doubt, I doubt if Jesus would be celebrating at that point anyway. There's no point in it. It was just the evening meal. Hey, you're the guest. Here, here's the bread. Go ahead and bless it for us. You know, like asking a guest at dinner to say grace. And this is interesting that Jesus revealed himself to those two men in a common meal. And really to think about it, this is how it often works. We have to learn to see Jesus in the everyday thing days, every, everyday things of life. You can tell I'm still tired. <laughs> Keep mixing my words up. In the everyday things of life, we are to live for Christ. I mean, we've often talked about I, from here, and you all talked about just praising the Lord, just driving down the highway toward Richfield, looking at the mountains and the valley all around us, the beauty of what's there, and you see the hand of God in this place. I know we joke around, this is God's country. Well, yeah, but I, I know why, because I can see the finger of Jesus, and I'm not satisfied with anything less. Yeah, I see the geology, too. I was a geology teacher for years doesn't matter. I, what I see is the handiwork of the Savior. So after opening the scriptures to them, Jesus opened their eyes. And now they knew, wow, no wonder we felt that way. Jesus is alive. He's here. All this putting together, evidence of the open tomb, the angels, the witnesses, the scriptures, now that personal experience. The fact that Jesus vanished didn't mean that he abandoned them. For he was still with them, even though they could not see him. And they were going to see him again. And their excitement, even after he left, it wasn't suddenly this deflated, oh, he's gone. Oh, bummer. Now I feel just like I did before. No. They were so excited, it's like, we got to tell somebody. Sound familiar? We got to tell somebody. After we've been, most of us have this... uh, testimony of after we've been saved we got to go and tell somebody we were saved and they looked at the same way they it was late and they said no we're heading back to jerusalem we got to tell the apostles we got to tell those guys jesus is alive and when they arrived but when they arrived the apostles and the others had told them you know Yeah, we saw it too. Peter saw it. Everyone's talking back and forth. Yeah, it'd be interesting. It's it's something that the sign, and I see it in our own fellowship, it's a sign of a thriving church when people get together, maybe not every single time, but when people get together and say, hey, let me show you, share with something with you what the Lord did for me today. Or let me tell you about what the Lord did. Or let me tell you how the Lord spoke to me. I hear that an awful lot among y'all, including the people who are not here. Okay. Let me tell, give you some word of encouragement the Lord told me. It's a wonderful thing. Our services are not dead because we serve a living Savior and we deal with a living Savior. And therefore, we are living as well. Now, we're going to stop here. Even as I mentioned, we're not going to continue on. The last portion of chapter 24 really fits nicely into Acts chapter 1. So it's kind of going to be a little dovetail because the whole point of this is looking at the beginnings of the church. We mentioned that over a year ago, why we were doing this series. Despite what many people think today, Jesus was real and he really did rise from the dead. The world tries to dismiss this Sometimes due to the lack of understanding of cultures from Jewish and Greek cultures, sometimes logic. I love that word, logic. But really, to be honest, whatever excuse they come up with, it's because ultimately they don't want the resurrection to be true because then they would be responsible and held to a higher authority to themselves. Men don't want to be held to the authority of God. However, the transformation of the most hardened sinner into an enthusiastic follower of Christ is perhaps the most most convincing evidence of all 
of the power of the resurrection. I mean, consider the case of James, the brother of Jesus. Just one example. He was a skeptic. He did not believe that Jesus said who he was before the crucifixion. In fact, they thought he was a little crazy. There's one point where they felt like going over, yeah, we need to take you away. Let's find the nice young men in their clean white suits and we can go just rest for a while, Jesus. You know, no. They thought he was nuts. And that was not just James, but Jude, the writer of the book of Jude, who was another brother of Jesus. But then Jesus appeared to them. And what happened? James became a leader in the early church. I think the best example is Saul. Saul the Pharisee, who was a huge persecutor. He was proud of it. He was convinced, I am doing this because this is how I am serving God, because this is how I've been taught. But as soon as Jesus appeared to him, literally, in a blink of an eye, he started becoming Paul the Apostle, one of the greatest defenders of the faith, spreading the gospel and planting churches throughout the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And more importantly, both James and Saul, or Paul, I should say, were willing to die for their confidence in the resurrected Christ. Like I said before, people don't die for a lie. Many people will die for what they believe to be true, but no one will die for a story they invented. With the exception of John, every single one of the apostles were martyred for their faith. And John was imprisoned as an old man on a Roman prison aisle of Patmos for his beliefs. You have Stephen, who died by stoning. John's brother James, one of the sons of thunder. He died by the sword at the hands of Herod. Peter and Paul both died at the hands of Nero, not for a lie, but as evidence for the crucifixion. During the 2,000 years since Christ lived on this planet, millions have died, persecuted for their belief in the resurrection. This shows us one thing. If we are honest, if we approach this with the mind of a child, it just shows us that we have no other real option to worship the risen Savior as our Lord and God. Father, we thank you for this time we've had. We thank you for the example of the resurrection. We thank you that you did rise from the dead. Because it's this and this alone that gave us our salvation. Everyone dies. But only you rose, Father. And Father, we ask, we ask of you to just pour your spirit upon us that we continue to hold strong to this. We continue to just boldly preach your resurrection, the gospel message to all, even to those that think it's foolishness. Your word tells us that the preaching of the word is foolishness to those who perish. And we know, Father, you want none to perish. You want all to come to repentance. And the only way they are going to come to repentance is if we boldly speak the word, the truth of the message of salvation through the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, just now give traveling mercies to us as we head home. Give traveling mercies to those who are out and about on vacation. Bring them back safely. Be with those who are ill or not feeling good and cannot be here. But Father, continue to bless us. Continue to use us in whatever way you see fit. We praise you. We thank you, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.